If you stand, let's worship. If there's one thing that you don't know about us, we do a lot of different types of music. Amen. And um, this uh, 
This next song is a song that's really become, become custom for us over the last couple of years just because it's different and it's fun. Amen. And it should be. Rejoice in the Lord should be fun. Amen. Amen. Silent night. Oh.
in our lungs is from you, yes. Lord God. The pulse that's in our vein comes from yes. you. And everything in life, Lord, 
is a gift from you. In you, we live and move and have our very being. Nothing exists apart from you. Nothing has purpose apart from you. And Lord, we thank you for the, the breath, the pulse, the calling, the presence. Thank you for your word. Lord, at everything, Lord God, we give thanks. In all things, Lord, we give thanks. And at all times, Lord, we give thanks. We thank you. You are a good, good God. And Lord, every good thing comes from you. It's all you're capable of producing. And Lord, even when the trials and the struggles come, the product that comes forth from that is good. You work all things together yes. for good, for good, for good. For good. Yes, yes, for good. Yes. For good. Yes. For good. Yes. So, Lord, we, we've come through a week of thanksgiving. And, Lord, as we are corporately here gathered today on this weekend, we want to give you thanks. We want to thank you. You are a good God. Yes, sir. And we thank you for everything, all that you do, all that you are. I thank you for your grace and for your mercy. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your Holy Spirit present upon us, Lord. And even, even the fact that we hear your voice and we, we sense your spirit and follow it brings confirmation of who we are. We are your children. We're your sons and daughters, Lord God. And that, Lord, you love us so much. And, Lord, that you have good things planned in store for us. How much you love us. It's precious. It's beautiful. And, Lord, we thank you. And we worship you, for you are worthy of praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Love being in the presence of God, amen. Yes, yes. No better place to be. No better place to be. I'm so glad to see everyone here at the Freedom Center. We're about loving God, loving others, living intentionally, seeing his kingdom come, seeing his will done here on earth just as it is in heaven. We believe in bringing salvation, deliverance, and healing to the world around us, but that's not only the things that we get to have, but he also gives us purpose that we each have a call that as long as you have breath in your lungs, there's a purpose and there's a call on your life that God put you here on this planet yes. for a reason. We want to help you guys with that. And that's what we're about here at the Freedom Center. So thank you so much for being here. And also everyone who is streaming live, don't go anywhere. You're in for something good. Thank you for being with us. And also we want to recognize our first and second timers. If you're with us for the very first or second time this morning, would you please stand? We just want to give you guys a warm welcome to our church body. My first and second timers. Thank you for being here with us this morning. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, our ushers have a little bag to give you. After that, you can grab a seat. In that bag, there's some information about our church, and there's a little card that if you fill out with your information and bring back to our information table at the end of service where the big TV screen is at the back, we have a little something for you guys from Chick-fil-A just to show our love and appreciation that you're here this morning. Amen. And our goal is as a church bar to give you guys either a hug or a high five before you get out of here. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get it done. And Mr. Grady, you're up. Hello, everyone. Uh, we do have plenty to sing about the goodness of God because we got the greatest band in the land here. Uh, and we do thank God for them. Uh, I want to announce that the next two Sundays, it's traditional here that we take up a love offering for our staff. And so the next two Sundays, so if you're prepared for that, we'll be doing that next, uh, the 15th, the 8th and the 15th. And now we're going to take up our offering. Uh, for those of you that need uh, envelopes, I uh, will pass out envelopes and uh, prayer request cards and uh, you turn them in in the buckets. Um, we thank God for each one of you here. Amen. We don't take you lightly because if we did, we wouldn't have you. And God would know it. 
and we don't want to do nothing that's displeasing to God. We thank you for your love and your kindness here and being here, being a part of this, because this, being here at the Freedom Center is a great place to be. Yes. And you won't know it until, you might not know it. If you do, don't know it, you get in a bind and see don't your Freedom family come see you. That's one of the greatest things about this church, the love and the unity. I found out myself when my grandson was sick, how they rallied around me, how they, me and my family, how they prayed for us, how they loved us through that storm. And today my baby is fat and happy. <laughs> every day, he want, every time he get a chance, he want to fight. And I enjoy that. That's one of the greatest joys of being here. And we thank you. Thank you, Elder Grady. He's one of our elders here at the Freedom Center. And, th and God knows the timing because he forced him to come speak. Because normally he's always, he's so humble as a man of God that he serves as the head of the ushers as well. And that's what he's doing. So that's why we're here. As you get your checks ready, get ready, hold them in your right hands. We're believing for God to provide. He always does. He's faithful. We serve a faithful. We're just singing of his faithful. So if you're ready, let's close our eyes and bow our head. Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for what you're doing here today. You're here. You were waiting on us to arrive, and we have. Father, bless this time together, Lord, of fellowship with one another. Father, we want to be faithful back to you and honor you with our tithes, with our offerings, and our alms, Father. And we give you praise. We give you glory. We ask, Lord, that you continue to provide, and even miraculously, as a miracle gift, Father, as you're doing, to meet every one of our needs. And I bless your people in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas, Freedom Center. Freedom. What's up? Christmas is just around the corner. It's snowing. It's cold outside. Hopefully, it's at that time to get presents, to get gifts, to get packages, <laughs> all that good stuff. All so that. we're so excited that Christmas is here. We have a couple of announcements coming your way. First off, this is going to be our December schedule for the rest of the month, our Sunday schedule. We're only doing one service, one service, the 1030 service. Those of y'all who come early, we want y'all to come at 1030. That's going to be for uh, December 8th, the 15th. 15th, the 22nd, and the 29th. So we're only doing one service at 10.30 a.m. We want to see you there. And ladies, get excited because this season coming up is our Christmas G. You know, ooh, ooh, ooh. It's going to be so much fun. Come dress festively. It's going to be great. And by all your friends, it starts at 6 for the food and 7 o'clock for the worship, the work, all of that fun stuff. So you do not want to miss out on this one. It's going to be the last one of the year. So I'm by everyone that you know. It's going to be so awesome. And today is December 1st, like we've been saying. So our angel tree has officially gone up at our info desk in the back. So take a look, see if there's a name that you want to pull to be a blessing for this Christmas season, and you're going to have two weeks to go shopping for the gifts to deliver to them on December 15th. And also we have our Christmas play that's coming up next Sunday. It's being put on by Katie Sharp. It's called The Light in Our Dwellings. It's going to be an amazing Christmas play. Again, that's going to be this next Sunday at the 1030 service. Come out and support us. And also, uh, we're having a community outreach yep. the following yep. Saturday, December 14th. We're opening this up to the entire community. Everybody, invite your friends, invite your family, invite that one coworker you've been meaning to invite to church. At this play, he's going to hear the gospel. Yes. We want to get this message out to as many people as we can. December 14th, don't miss it. Yeah, so the flyers for that are going to be in the back for you guys to invite everyone that you know. There's going to be hot cocoa, pigeons with Santa, and of course our awesome musical. So make sure you are there. Be there or what church? Be square. You don't want to be a square. You don't want any of that. <laughs> and I want to remind you guys that Molo, our mother of little ones, is going to be meeting this Thursday for the last time of the year. And a couple other ministries are meeting for the last time this year are going to be our Friday ladies Bible studies and our sewing and knitting classes. So if you're a part of those ministries, we're going to go on winter break. We will see you guys in January. Yeah, and also just a reminder about our December schedule. This is our last time, but December 8th, the 20, 15th, the 22nd, and the 29th. We're only doing so one service, so many dates. One service, 10.30 a.m. There's going to be no early service. One service, 10.30. One big happy family. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Woo! We did it. We did it. <laughs> okay, we'll see you next week. Bye, church. Love you. All right. Along with several baptisms that we have today, guess what we also have? A baby dedication. Woo! And I don't want to be, you know, out of line here, but 
it's a very special one today because it's Jameson. <laughs> Why don't y'all come on up? Family, friends, I think we have a couple elders here. Most of our elders were in the second, first service. So Jameson's 13 months now. Can you believe it? He's not said G Paul yet. We're working on that. But he is getting very mobile. Yes, the fun has started. And we got quite a crew here. Let me go through, get my list so I don't mess up. <laughs> We've got, uh, of course, Cody, Katie, and uh, Matt and Cindy Matthews. Or our grandparents, great grandmother Catherine White, uncles Brad and Jacob. Where are you guys at? Oh, okay. Grandparents Greg and Linda. Hello. <laughs> this is a first for me. Uh, grand, uh, great grandmother Glenda Palmacall. I think I saw. There you are, Glenda. Uh, my mom and dad were not able to be with us today. CJ and Carolyn Crawford. They'll see the stream. And of course, aunts and uncles got Jenna, Michael. Gregory, Kara, and Daniel are with us. Wow. All the way from China. I think y'all might have the record for coming the longest way for a baby dedication. And then, of course, friends, Brian and Kelsey, and their baby, Olivia, and then Bo and Kelsey. Did I say that right? Yes. I want to, uh, I'm going to read this passage. I quote it all the time when, I, actually, I quote it all the time in sermons, and I quote it uh, at baby dedications, but to me, it's one of the most beautiful passages in Scripture regarding God's love over us individually. Jeremiah chapter 1, now the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. That's just, that's amazing. Before I formed you in the womb, before you were, I always put it this way, before you were molecular, before you were human tissue, Jer Jameson, God knew you. God knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. It means he set you apart. And I appointed you a prophet to the nations. That's gifting, already gifted. Then I said, alas, O Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak because I'm a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm a youth because everywhere I send you, you shall go. And all that I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. And what a beautiful promise that is to all of us, and it is to Jameson. So we just want to put our hands on Jameson, and Father, we, we come to you right now. And Lord, we understand, Lord, that you are sovereign. And yes. You had a plan. Jameson was in your thoughts way, way back in eternity past. Lord, that you have a purpose and a calling on his life and you have giftings in him. And the joy of uh, Cody and Katie is to figure that out. They're going to watch, Lord, the ways that he is bent, naturally bent and called, and they'll nurture those things. I really believe, Father, your word says that, Lord, that uh, to train them in the ways of the Lord and they'll not depart from it. That's not just scripture, but that's everything and how you formed him and how you called him and how you gifted him and consecrated him. And, Lord, that they'll see those things and they'll recognize them and tend to those things. And, Lord, that Jameson, as he grows, will have a heart for you to love you with all of his heart, with his mind and his soul. Father, to have ears that hear your voice, hear when you speak. Lord, to sense your spirit and be sensitive to it and to your leading. And, Lord, that you will use him mightily for your kingdom, for his purpose in the earth. For such a time as this, Lord, he's born into this earth at this strategic time for strategic purposes for your kingdom and for your calling on his life. And, Lord, that you will be with him all the days of his life. And, Lord, he'll find your word to be a strength. Lord, it'll be food to his soul and to his heart. And, Lord, that your spirit, Lord, will be confirmation, your presence of how much you love him and that he's your child and he's your son. So we speak these blessings over him and for Katie and for Cody and all the family, all of us, Lord, that we support that. And Lord, that we will 
we will be that community to them to help raise him and train him in the ways that you would have him go. And we just speak blessings over him and over this family. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 At this moment of service, as they're getting down, I'm going to ask those that are going to be baptized to get over to the side. Uh, pastor's going to be baptizing some first, but I have a special request I'm going to honor. And I am going to ask Sister Lowe to come first. We're going to baptize Sister Lowe first, and then we'll move on. Pastor Greg will follow it. The ones he's going to do, then I'll do the rest. We're so happy to, that we're here. Run hell, get us festive right now, because this is party time. This is a glorious time of the Lord. Just come with me, my sister. Sister Lotus, when she asked me about wanting to be baptized, she said again. She made it known to me that she did it when she was a young girl. But she felt the conviction in her heart and her spirit to, you know what? I know better now. And thus, I want that blessing to be upon it of obedience in a greater level. She is an anointed woman of God, so it's an honor for me to baptize her right now. So I'm going to ask I already know the answer to the question, but I'm going to ask it anyhow. Sister, Sister Lowe, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I have, and with the evidence of speaking in, the, in my heavenly language. Praise the Lord for all of that. We're going to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Pastor Greg's getting ready to take over for a little bit, then I'll follow back up. you the question, have you received Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and following in a believer's baptism, sealing that decision Amen. Um, that we do is um, obedience to the Lord. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. As they always said when I was a child, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk yes. in newness of life. Amen. Amen. It's a beautiful picture. said it's hot, but I said that's a good thing. Yeah. Jeff, have you
you prayed to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. I just want you to know this is one of my purple book guys. Yeah. Walking through the purple book with Jeff. Yes. And I said this to him on the phone the other day, and I want to say it to you right now in this moment. I'm proud of you. Proud of you. Proud of all that the Lord is doing in your heart yes. and, and you're surrendered to him and allow him to move in your life. And I want you to know your Father God is happy. He's pleased. So I want to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This young lady, I'm not sure who she is. Who is this? <laughs> She's a, a double header today. Yes. Baby dedication and baptism. And I think just like her daddy, baptized twice when I was a kid. But um, something happened along the way where real transformation took place. Yes. Being born again and realizing that after that process, wanting to follow in that repentance, that decision, and that decision of Christ. So, Katie, have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Yes. So, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Next, yes, yay! Come on, people, let's get excited. This is good. This is good. I, I guarantee you, the heavens rejoicing right now, and we need to join them in that. Yes, Lord. All right, and Anna, I'm proud of you too. Just want you to know that. Yeah. <laughs> She said it feels great. <laughs> you know, um, I think it's a beautiful testament to our church that, you know, we teach on baptism one Sunday and the response of so many of knowing I need that in my life. And here's Anna with the same, same response. I need to follow in believer's baptism for what the Lord has done in my life. So I baptize you, Anna, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is Zach Stember. Bless the Lord. He and I go way back. Yes, back when he knew of my power ministry. Fivefold. <laughs> when I when I was a youth pastor back in the day. And uh, he was a member of the church that I came from many years ago. And uh, came, uh, oh, what, was it a month or so ago, two months ago? About a month ago. And I think it was probably that second week. He prayed to receive Christ right down here at the front. Wow. So, Zach, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I do. All right. I baptize you, Zach, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Curtis. Ashley? Okay, there's Ashley. Come on, Ashley.
This is Ashley. And Ashley, I just want to tell you how proud of, I am of you. And um, she has a heart to want to know God. Yes. And a heart to want to obey God. Yes. I can't tell you how many times. It's almost every Sunday. Ashley corners me at the end of that service. Tell me what you meant by that. Explain yes. this to me. And we'll read the word together. Yes. And I'm proud of you for that. It shows your heart. You love the Lord and Amen. you want to obey him. You want to know him. And uh, Ashley, do you know the Lord Jesus, your Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. All right. <laughs> well, I baptize you, Ashley, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is Curtis, Ashley's husband. Yes. <laughs> yes, bless the Lord. One year today. Wow. Wow. That's beautiful. And, uh, and I got to walk Ashley down the aisle. It was a beautiful day. And uh, now baptizing the two of you together. And uh, Curtis, have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. Well, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. A tag team with Reuben and dry out here. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> it really is a joy. There's still room if you want to get in the line. The line's right over here, so don't be afraid of it. We've had that before when the Lord did that. He moves and He's here. He's moving within us. Getting ready for Sister Olga to come. Here we come. I'm overjoyed that I get the opportunity to baptize Sister Olga Sisko, otherwise known as Preston's mom. Uh, yeah, I will clap because if you know the miracle that Preston is, you know why God honored that miracle is because of mama here. And I have firsthand knowledge of that. She's not just anybody, she's an incredible woman of God who walks in humility and faith, and when everybody else could easily give up, she would never give up. Believe that her God was still able to raise the dead, and he has, yes. and he is. So today, I, I get to ask you that very important question. Have you received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? Most certainly have. Amen. Yes, and it's my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Armando stepping in. It is one, it's nice and toasty, yes. When I got baptized, it was ice cold, so I, I, I enjoy this warm water here. Just, just move up a little bit forward. There you go. Tell everybody your full name so they know. Armando Vallejos. Armando, have you received the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Yes. Amen. And it's my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.
I'm going to ask Brother Kenneth Coleman to come up. He's going to do the honors of baptizing my sister Stevie Benoit. I remember that song, Wade in the Water. Yeah. Yeah. God's going to trouble the water. He's troubling the waters this morning. Stevie, have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I have. Therefore, based upon the word of God and your confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Next, we have uh, Sister Robin Bookwalter, and I believe her dad's going to do the honors. We're excited about that. That's an incredible blessing. Come on, Brother Ray. Robin, your mom and I are very proud of the fact that you are living a committed life to Christ, and we're happy that you're making this public announcement today. So have you accepted Jesus as your personal Savior? I have. And I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes, all right. Praise God. All right, now get back into it. We welcome Brother Robert Scarlett. Hey, it is toasting. You get to drop your feet in there and sit as close to the edge as you can. Because you're a little on the taller side, thank God. Come forward a little bit this way somewhat. A little more, a little more. I don't want your head hidden in the back there. Brother Robert, have you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? Yes, I have. And it's my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's give the Lord some glory this morning. Let's not be quiet. Let's not be silent. This is not he all heavens breaking loose. We got to enjoy it down here. The Lord is here. This next person that is coming up for baptism, his name is Alfred Franco. I have the blessing of knowing Alfred Wow, for over 37 years. We met when I first started working at Kroger's. We worked together. Never realized that one day the Lord would bless me by having him accept the Lord as his Savior. Take your time, Alfred. And him and his wife, Elia, who sit on this side, have been faithfully coming ever since. And I'll admit, he's definitely a gift of God to me. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> My brother, I love you. It's an honor to know that you have Jesus and that we were eternal brothers. We live in eternity in the presence of our Heavenly Father. So, Alfred, I ask you the question Have you confessed with your mouth? And right now you're proclaiming before these people Have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. And it is my privilege and honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.
Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. We welcome our sister, Carlene Stewart, to the baptismal waters. We thank the Lord for her step of faith, of wanting to be obedient. Felt that she did not want to let this opportunity pass. Sister Carlene, have you confessed with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is your Lord and your King? I have. Amen. Well, I'm going to, my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Welcome, Sister Debbie Richards. I see the line's gotten shorter. Just if you want to come join it, I don't mind. <laughs> Scoot up a little bit more. Just want to make sure. That's awesome. It's a joy to see you here today. <laughs> My sister, have you confessed in your heart and received Jesus there to live inside of you as your Lord? I accept Jesus and received Him. Yes. And it's my joy to baptize you in the name of the Father and His Son and His Holy Spirit. Tony Jaramillo. You get to say it right. Jaramillo. There you go. See, so saying hello. I've seen the transformation of the presence of the Lord in his life that he's been doing. And he's enjoying the blessings of Jesus, but he wanted to go. He goes, I've been baptized before, but I need to connect this one right. Let's up a little bit. Brother Tony. Is Jesus your Lord and Savior? Yes, he is, my one and only. Amen. Amen. And he lives in you, right? Yes, he does. And I love him so much. So it's my joy and honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I think we saved the best for last. Sister Betty Jackson's in the house. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. We're excited. Sister Betty, thank you. This is a little drop right here with your feet. No, your feet come this way. There you go. Take it slowly. There you go. There you go. Sister Betty, have you received the Lord Jesus as your Savior? Of course. Amen. And I know he's already filled you with the Spirit, but he, we want some more. So we want to take you down and bring you back up. Be prepared for the newness of the gift of the Spirit that's upon you, that what he's going to pour into you in this act of obedience. I know he's ready. <laughs> he's ready. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, I baptize you.
Why don't you stand? Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like death. Your holy name. 
worship your holy name. I worship your holy name. I worship your should be seated. If you'll go ahead and show that video. can't believe we've got it all in. <laughs> and you may get out here on time on top of it because I did shorten the word today anticipating all the baptisms that we were going to have. But um, a real important word nonetheless. More of a talk, I guess, than a sermon, a little teaching. And uh, I, I, I stated uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about communion and how important communion is and why we take communion. We're proclaiming His return, right? We're proclaiming his death, his resurrection, Lord, that he's ascended to the right hand of the Father and that he's returning. Every time we take communion, we're supposed to do this often and proclaim that to one another. And then I figured since we was talking about uh, communion, hey, I'm on a roll, let's talk about baptism. So we talked about baptism. Well, you see the product of that, right? What came forth of that, amen. And the emphasis is that the, the power is not in the tub, the power is in the blood of Jesus Christ, but we are responding by faith and obedience because he's commanded us to do so. And it is a covenant assigned saying, hey, I'm leaving that flesh behind. And I believe spiritually he actually does something in our heart where there, there's a circumcision of our heart and that dead flesh remains behind. I believe that took place today for every heart that was baptized. And so I figured, hey, we talked about baptism. Let's stay on the roll, Right? So we'll talk about Sabbath today, Sabbath. And I showed you the Big Ten, right? That was the Ten Commandments, the Big Ten, not, not a football conference, right? Uh, the Ten Commandments. And I call it the Big Ten because there's actually these Ten Commandments that he gave right out of the hat to the people of Israel. And right snuggled in the middle of, you know, having no gods before him, no idols, you know, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not sit. Right in the middle of all this stuff is, and, and keep the Sabbath, and keep that day holy. And, you know, I don't think in the modern church that we talk about that very much. It's almost like we've discounted that when, because, you know, Jesus didn't nullify, he completed the law, right? But guess what? Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill lie. Thou shalt not steal. Those are still applicable laws and commands of God along with the Sabbath. So I, wanted, I, want to, I want to kind of open your thoughts today. I want to stir your thoughts. And this is not just for something to take place in here today. It's when you leave this week. I want you to really contemplate this. I'm actually setting you up for the new year. I want you to really think about this, a lifestyle change for the next year. And you know, uh, we're going to look at the actual command in a minute in Scripture, but I just wrote in my notes, this is the first thing I thought, was gone are the days of blue law. You know, you know, only the folks around my age or older would even chuckle at that to know what that means, right? Because I began to see that dismantled in my childhood 
But as I, I was born in 1964 and through the 60s into the early 70s, there was blue law. It was that, you know, you, 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 things were shut down on Sunday. And actually, even when I was in youth ministry in the 80s, it, it began to dismantle really in the 80s for sure. Churches or schools and, 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 uh, and other organizations actually left Wednesday night alone too, knowing that churches assembled on Wednesday nights. And you didn't mess with Sunday. Now, Little League Baseball tramples all over Sunday morning. But back in the day with Blue Law, there was actually laws that stores were closed. You didn't go shopping. There wasn't retail stores open for you to go leisurely shopping. Didn't happen. If a grocery store was open, when you went in there, there were certain things you weren't going to be able to buy. There was no beer, wine, and liquor bought on Sunday. Hello? And yes, those laws, and what's, here's interesting, this really is, because those were not federal laws. Those were state laws. And those state laws were uniform across the nation. Our nation had an understanding of a day of worship and a Sabbath. And, 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 and that law was defended. It was challenged many times. And the Supreme Court defended that law many times, even though... It was you know, knowledgeable, it was common knowledge, it was motivated from religion, yet the Supreme Court acknowledged it had a secular benefit. It protected federal mail carriers. They actually got a break. They got a day off. It also, in general, protected workers and it protected families, the family unit. It contributed to societal stability and guaranteeing the free exercise of religion. Those aren't my words, that's what the Supreme Court said in defending blue law. They were, we were so strict about it. I remember as a kid in the 60s, my dad was mowing the yard on a Sunday. Yeah, oh no. My mother-in-law was there. Or my mother-in-law, my father's mother-in-law. Thank God for mother-in-laws, right? <laughs> my father's mother, my grandmother, walked out and rebuked my dad for mowing the lawn on Sunday. Shortly, moments later, he got stung by wasps. She said, see there? Not supposed to be working on Sunday. Now, whether or not God had anything to do with that or it had to do with him working on Sunday that he got stung by watch, you be the judge. I don't really care. It's not the point. The point is that within our culture, Sabbath and the Lord's Day used to be a strong part of our religious experience and our religious culture. There's two terms here I want you to understand that I'm throwing around here. The Lord's Day. The Lord's Day is used one time in Scripture. It's in Revelations, actually. John refers to the Lord's Day. It's the day of resurrection. It's the, the first day of the week. It's the day that Jesus Christ came out of that grave, and it's referred to as the Lord's Day. First day of the week. Sabbath, as we know it from the Old Testament, that's the day that it was set aside to cease from working, cease from activities, and they worshiped also on that day as well. But it fell on the seventh day, the last day of the week. So in our terms, the day of the Lord would be Sunday. Sabbath would be Saturday. Everybody with me? This question's always asked to me. It was asked to me recently a couple of times. How did we get to worshiping on Sunday instead of Saturday? And there's no clear-cut answer to that other than to tell you it was handed down to us through church history believed to have been established by the apostles. We only get one glimpse where maybe it's implied, and that's in Acts 20, verse 7. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. And what we get out of that is that we see there was a habit of the apostles to gather on the day of the Lord, the first day of the week, the resurrection day of Jesus. We also get a, a sense there that Paul was observing something because he was unwilling to leave on that day. He was going to wait to leave on the next day. And typically when he preached, there were summations of sermons. They weren't long teachings. But here he stayed and they remained assembled all day until midnight, the end of that day, implying that they were probably also observing Sabbath together on the day of the Lord. Now, we don't know particularly. There's no clear verse that gives us verbiage that indicates any transfer of Sabbath from, Sunday to, uh, from Saturday to Sunday, except for the practice of the church historically. Um, but we do see in the infancy of Christianity a possible shift of the apostles observing Sabbath and worshiping on Sunday rather than on, on uh, Saturday. 
But sure as Christianity began to grow, this we must also keep in mind, as Christianity grew, it grew, uh, it, it, it lessened as a messianic influence and it grew with Gentiles. And the Gentiles didn't have a problem with observing Sabbath and worshiping on a Sunday. That was a, a messianic culture. So what I'm shooting for today is that I want us to take our attention off of the particular day. Instead, I want to ask you this question. Do you have a day? That's the most important question. Do you actually have a day? Do you have a day set aside for Sabbath? The word Sabbath comes from a Hebrew verb that means to cease, stop, rest, to come to an end. Based on that definition of the word, the Sabbath day was a day to cease from work, a 24-hour period of time set aside for God and for rest. So my question again to you, do you have a day where you unplug from the rat race of this world? That's the question that needs to be asked. Not legalistically trying to, well, Saturday, Sunday. No, do you have a day that you're actually setting aside ceasing from the activities of this world and resting in Him. If you think that Sunday is that day, you ought to walk in my shoes one Sunday. <laughs> this is the most wearisome, tiresome day of the week. This is game day, right? I mean, I, I generally, I, I was well prepared with a, a shorter message and and so I slept in a little later today. My alarm clock went off at 5 instead of around 4.30. But sometimes I'm up between 4.45, 5 o'clock, preparing for this moment. And something is, exudes out of your body as far as strength is concerned. When you stand up here and lead worship for two services and you preach for two services, I feel good when I leave here, but by the time I get home and take a shower and put on some comfortable clothes and fill my belly with food, boom, I collapse, Right? This is not really a day of rest for me. It doesn't count as a Sabbath at all. Not for me. So Sabbath is not just coming to church. Sabbath is not linked to just us gathering here together. You need a day of rest. You need a day to stop. With all that being said, I want us to go back and we're going to look at the Big Ten now in Scripture as it is written in Exodus 20. Exodus 20 begins right there, verse 1. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol of any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the third and fourth generations of those who hate me but showing loving kindness to the thousands, to those who love me and keep my commands. Now, that one he put quite a bit of verbiage to, right? Then he says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Then in verse 8 he says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle, or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sixth and all that is in them, and then rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And then it goes on. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So right in the list of all these commands with murder, lying, adultery, idol worship, all this stuff, right in the middle of all these commands, commands that are still applicable today is this command to observe a day of rest. And of course, it comes from Genesis 2, where God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 2, 2 through 3 says, For the seventh day God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. First point of keeping Sabbath for us today 
is being imitators of God. Simply put, God did it, so should we, <laughs> right? Um, here's, here's, here's part of imitating God. This process of holiness, you know what holiness in a nutshell really is? Loving the things that God loves and hating the things that God hates. That's holiness. That my desires are in line with his desires. That I, I love what he loves and likes what he likes. God being our heavenly father, we want to be imitators of what he likes and we want to love what he loves and we want to do what he says to do. We want to imitate him. And we should keep Sabbath simply because God kept Sabbath. He did so, so should we. As God stopped and ceased from working, so should we. If we fail to see the value of Sabbath, then we will fail to see one of the first fundamental things that God did directly following creation. God rested, and he set aside a day as holy. Now, this, this feels weird to our culture. This, this actually, you can actually, if you practice this, you have to get over feeling guilty. I should be doing something. <laughs> This needs to be done. This needs to be, you, get, you need to get over that. Whew, rest. Be still. I know that he's God. Be still. See, on the sixth day, that was the climax of all of God's work. He created heaven and earth and every living thing in it. He created a habitat for man. He made both male and female. He, he, and upon the end of that sixth day of all that creating, the climax of all that creation, when he was done, the seventh day, he rested. God, the creator of all things, rested. And we have plenty of days to chase our things and our dreams, but we better learn the discipline of being unplugged from business and self-centered goals, our own desires, and learn to rest, to be still, and know he's God. I, I, I told you a moment ago, Sunday is not a rest day for me. That's a collapse day for me. And, and, if, and for me, my week really climaxes for me at, at, at Wednesday night. The end of family is on the go. Having come through preparation for Sunday, execution of Sunday, coming in on Monday, and all the regular business that we do, and counseling, and decision making, and all of the things, Bible study, executing those Bible studies, at the end of that Wednesday night, I'm done. I'm done. And I'm ready to get away and have solitude. When I get up on Thursday morning, I don't pick up my phone. My phone stays right there on the bedside. I'll come back later around 12, 30, 1 o'clock, check messages, make sure no emergencies happen, put it back and leave it and get away from it must have an unplugged downtime, a time created for rest to do nothing. Hello? <laughs> People ask me, what are you doing this weekend? I always say, hopefully nothing. Nothing. To escape people. <laughs> to escape work. To escape demands. Decisions. Strife find solitude, to find rest. It resets me when I do that. See, you may be here today and you'll say, well, my work schedule doesn't really allow me, at least not Saturday or Sunday. That's fine. I'm saying get over what day it is. Just get one. Pick one. Fight for that day. Work hard to protect that day, a day of rest and a day of of doing nothing, a 24-hour period where you literally become unplugged from the rat race of the world. I said, that, first of all, the process is to be imitators of God. Here's the second thing about Sabbath. God brings benefit to you by obeying it. He brings benefit to you by obeying it. You know, just as we talked about communion and the obedience of communion, there's a, there's a, there is a spiritual impact. There's a physical impact in, in taking communion in a worthy manner versus an unworthy manner, right? There is a physical impact and a spiritual impact that takes place when we, we follow in believers' baptism. I do believe literally there's a circumcision in the heart. There's an old flesh that is left behind. This is a renewing to walk in newness of life. That's why one coming up like this, yes, it's exactly what it is. It's victory taking place in that process. 
I believe in weddings when they take place and a couple comes and they share vows to one another and they pledge their hearts to one another and they exchange the covenant rings with one another with those vows and the rings. I believe there is a spiritual benefit of them coming together in marriage along with a physical benefit. Hallelujah, right? We talked about that. Don't need to elaborate. But as well with Sabbath, there is a physical and spiritual benefit as we practice it. And what I want us to do is to correlate this and put it in context of tithing because we understand tithing. This church is a very giving church. This church understands the principle of tithing. Giving here at the Freedom Center, we understand there's a cause and effect through giving. I mean, just simply in spiritual terms in the kingdom, the mercy you don't give is the mercy you don't get, right? There is a cause and effect in giving. We understand that. Things are set in motion as we give. We understand. God said regarding the tithe, test me in this and see if I won't open the windows of heaven. He's guaranteed it. He's promised it. If you exercise it, you will see a benefit physically and spiritually in your life as you practice it. God even set a formula to the process. He made it simple for us. He said, you know what? Here's, here's the whole pie, right? Just give me 10% of that pie. You can do what you want to with the rest. And as we obey him in that process, we begin to see a spiritual blessing. He's promised it for it to be so. And then also as we look at that pie, then we get, get moved to the Spirit of the Lord. We say, you know what, God? You're so good. I'm going to give you more of this pie. We wound up giving alms and offerings to him, and he opens up the window of heaven, and there is a blessing and a return. And some of you are nodding your head yes and clapping your hands because you've experienced it. If I were to say for the next four weeks, we're going to put a microphone here and everybody testify in our services of what God has done through the process of giving in your life, we would probably need to go on a couple more weeks of everybody testifying of all that God has done and how you've seen them move through the process of giving. Spiritual blessing, physical blessing. Most of you understand this. There's a testimony of faithfulness of God in keeping his word regarding the tithe. So my point to you today is that just as the other nine commandments of the Big Ten didn't become obsolete because of Jesus, neither did Sabbath. And when you choose to keep it, God shows himself through your obedience. And I want to give you five reasons why. Here's the first reason why. Just as with the tithe that I just explained, where the honest truth is, everything we have belongs to him. <laughs> everything we have. All we're doing is sitting back and saying, Lord, how much of this do I live on? How much of it's yours? And he gave us a formula. He said, well, I tell you what, you tithe 10%, you do what you want to with the 90%. And then out of our hearts, he sees it, us giving beyond that. It's beautiful. So he's given us a formula there. Formula there. And, 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 and uh, as he does this, our week belongs to the Lord, just as with tithing. He's given us seven days. He's given us a week. But here's what he said. I've given you six days to get everything you need to get done. That seventh one, it's holy. Leave it alone. Wow. Just like tithing, just like our finances, just like our money. When we observe Sabbath, we're affirming. This is the second point. When we observe Sabbath, we're affirming God as the center of our lives. What we're saying is, God, money is not the center of my life. My job is not the center of my life. You know, clout, prestige, position is not the center of my life. Lord, you are the center of my life, and I'm going to stop in this day, and I'm going to be still. The third thing is we're, we are trusting God that within those six days, we can get done what we need to get done, but the seventh is to be set aside and remain holy knowing that no matter what we think needs to get done, God will cover us. God will move on our behalf if we choose to honor him and keep Sabbath. We're trusting him in that process. Fourth, we are, lack, we are acknowledging through obedience of setting aside that one day, he's actually on his throne. You are the Lord of lords and King of kings, that you are faithful and in control. You are true to your word. I'm not going to worry about what I think needs to get done, what hasn't been done. I don't have to bite my fingernails. I'm going to trust God. And fifth, when we are resting, he is working. 
When we are resting, he is working. God never sleeps nor slumbers. His work was finished, and he rested. Ours is not yet complete. We will soon rest continuously, but until then, we honor him by observing the Sabbath, being still before him. So what do you do on the Sabbath? I think I said it already, but just to reiterate, here's the best thing you can do on Sabbath. Nothing. Nothing. Be still. Listen for his voice. You know, I hear a lot of people that say, well, I've really not heard him speak. Well, it's probably because you haven't been still and rested and sat in solitude and quietness. Jesus had to do it all the time. How much more so we need to be still in solitude. Rest. Do nothing. Rest. Sure, you can eat. <laughs> yes, you can read a book. You can watch a movie. You can even go out to eat. That's all right. But I would encourage you, do only things that nourish your soul, nourish your heart, replenish your mind, reset you. And, and particularly, ladies, let it go. I'm talking about your nest. I think, I think ladies have the hardest time with this. Because that, that place where you work so hard and diligently is right before you. Which is why you probably just need to get on out of the house and go for a walk. That's what my wife loves to do. Go for a walk. Get away from You do not have to do those things. It will be there tomorrow. Right? Hello. I'm not talking about being lazy either because, you know, Sabbath is 24 hours, not 48 hours, right? It's one day. <laughs> but the point is to rest. Cease from work and rest. Avoid work-related stuff. It's okay to let that phone go. Guys, what did we do before cell phones? We rested, probably. <laughs> It's not just for your body, it's for your mind. Unplug from life's demands, rest. Do things that replenish the soul, renew you. You need a day with no obligations. Here's the last point. Sabbath is accumulative. What I mean by this relates again to tithing. How many of you know when it comes to tithing, you can learn this the easy way or the hard way. But that 10% that belongs to God, he's going to get it one way or the other. He's, on, he's either going to get it by you being obedient and you see this accumulative return, or you refuse to do it and you're going to see an accumulative loss. And you'll wonder why the car is breaking down. You'll wonder why the appliances keep failing. And you'll wonder why, man, it just seems like money's falling through my fingers like a sift, like sand. You know, I just can't even hold it. Well, that's because you haven't practiced and exercised a blessing through obedience of tithing. There is a, an, a cause and effect to that process. Guess what, guys? It's true with the Sabbath. You can not heed this word. You can learn it the hard way. But if you do not observe that day, whatever that day is for you, and you burn the candle at both ends, it's a cumulative effect. It will catch up to you. You're going to find it that you're laid down for more days than one with sickness, brokenness. You might discover, and I, as I had to this week, certain inflammation, pain in my body. Been wondering why it won't go away, and there's not enough medicines that can make it go away. And guess what? He put me in the bed for 24 hours. I had to rest. And upon resting, pain was released. I guarantee you, if we made this a lifestyle change, there might be a lot of things going on in your body that might disappear because of the accumulative effect of simply obeying God by keeping the Sabbath. Um, let me read this just so I can read it. No, I said that already. Um, the only reason why we would refuse to do so, that we would choose not to trust that God can bring the increase through us through working less, 
the fact is that if we obey God, you will get more done in six days than you could ever possibly do in seven. It's just a fact. I could tell you a bunch of stories I've read this week where people were, particularly companies, obedient to that, that keeping of the Sabbath where they got more done, they excel above other companies in their area because they honor the Sabbath and their employees are more rested and they're more productive because of the effect that Sabbath has and brings to our bodies through rest. I was reading, there's a boat company. They're still in business today, but in, I think it was 2008, they, they actually sold and they're no longer uh, family-owned, but they were established in 1925. Uh, it was the Fl- Florida Variety Boat Company. And in 1930, they changed their name to Pine Castle Boat and Construction. Eight years later, they changed their name to Correct Craft, not Swift Craft, Correct Craft. Somebody misheard me in the first service. Correct Craft. They actually don't go by that name any longer. There's some names, if I were to say, you'd recognize them that they actually own now, different boats, particularly big on ski boats. And there's more detail to this story than what I'm going to give you. It's kind of watered down on the Internet. But uh, Chris Herndon owns one of these ski boats. And when he bought the boat, they gave him a detailed book of the company's history and how they were believers in the Lord. And in, in um, 1945, during the World War II, uh, American troops had reached the Rhine River, but they lacked the transport boats to get across it. And so they commissioned actually several companies to produce boats for them to get across the Rhine River. Correct Craft was commissioned to supply this, these storm boats, and they were, to, they were to supply them and create them within 30 days. They wanted about 400 to 500 boats from them in 30 days. Well, this company only put out about 50 boats a month. So now they're set here with a challenge. They're commissioned to put out 400 to 500 boats in a month when they've never done that before. And the company didn't work on Sundays. And despite production pressure and pressure from the government that they're going to work 24-7 and seven days a week, and they said, no, we're not. They actually struggled with that contract of not giving it to them because they wouldn't. And finally the president said, give them the contract. So they got the contract. And they said on their own side, they said, nevertheless, through a combination of prayer and remarkable ingenuity. Well, you know what that ingenuity was because I I was talking to Chris Hernan after the first service because he's got the book. He's more familiar with their history. They actually wouldn't work. They cut loose on Wednesday nights early too so everybody could go to church on Wednesday. So they observed Wednesday night and Sunday. And so they're refusing to hear what the government wants. They're cutting them loose on Wednesdays. And they're not working on Sundays. And in the middle of the night on a Wednesday, during prayer, the son of the owner gets this intuitive idea from the Lord of how they can create an assembly line and assemble these boats in a fast, quick fashion for the government. And uh, Correct Craft developed this innovative production process. It allowed the factory to produce the needed number of boats in record time, doing it in a six-day week, resting on the seventh day, finishing before schedule, no other company even came close to them. The National Geographic called it a miracle production. The United States Army awarded them a company an E flag for efficiency. (coughs) And over 94 years of business, they also have gone all over the world building houses for homeless families, serving schools and orphanages, feeding the hungry, fighting human trafficking, and supporting other like-minded organizations. And guess what? They now enjoy annual sales that exceed $700 million a year. Yeah. And I, that company believes it stems back to that moment that they didn't fold They knew, and they got more done in six days. They they actually produced over 400 boats in 15 days when they had only been putting out 50 boats in a month, and nobody came close to that. And they did it by working six days instead of seven, honoring the Sabbath. There is a blessing both spiritually and physically when you do things God's way. When you do things God's way. Other companies tried to fill the order. They couldn't do it. Through prayer and trusting God, 
while they rested, God worked on their behalf. I believe that. He renewed them physically. Those, those workers came to work renewed and refreshed where other companies are driving their, their employees working seven days a week, 24-7, and they're exhausted. And guess what happens when your employees that are building something are exhausted? Guess what also happens? Mistakes. Having to work twice, right? Correcting things didn't happen in their company because they observed the Sabbath. So it's a good practice for us. And I am compelling you, this church, really pray about this. And particularly going into the new year, making a lifestyle change of having a day, a day that you set aside as Sabbath, where you're still, you cease from all the mess. Let the Lord quiet your spirit. Be still. Know He's God. Stop from work. Allow Him to renew your soul, renew your mind, renew your spirit through solitude, through worship. Get out and just take a walk in nature. Go spend a day in a park. Take your Bible with you and just read and take, have a picnic out there. Spend time with God. Solitude. Cease from working. Replenish yourself. Just as God said of the tithe, test me and see if I won't open the windows of heaven for you. I'm going to tell you, God is honored when you commit yourself to the Sabbath. He will show himself. It's an important principle to him. It's all through Scripture from the beginning to the end. He talks about the Sabbath. We're going to do a fast here soon, and I'm going to call you to a fast at the first of the year. We're going to do that. I'm calling it the God fast because Isaiah 58. Be reading Isaiah 58. Here's the good news. I'm not going to talk about food because God fast in Isaiah 58, he never did mention food. What he mentioned was pouring yourself out to others. And as you go through all these things, as God describes that God fast, what kind of fast pleases him when he gets to the end, you know what he also talks about? The Sabbath. Keeping the Sabbath. Resting. Being still. That's how he intended for us to live. It's woven within the design of creation. I mean, guys, if you've got any farmers out there, it's even true for the land. In Scripture, you're supposed to rest the land, right? After you've plowed it and planted for so many years, you're supposed to rest that land on that seventh year. It's an important principle to God. So find your day, set it aside, make it a lifestyle change. And guys, I want to tell you, you will see the benefit to your health, to your mind. I believe it's going to impact relationships. It's going to impact your efficiency to do things, to accomplish things. Those dreams that you have, those things that you want to see done, they'll happen better within six if you give God the seventh. Amen? Everybody stand. I'm going to ask our prayer teams to come. We'll close with our prayer teams here and... Um, allowing people to come and pray. And if you're here today, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we sure would love to pray with you about that, love to talk with you about that. And um, if you're here today, you, know, you need prayer for healing, you need prayer for breakthrough, whatever you might need, you might need some wisdom about a situation, we'd love to pray with you concerning that. Anybody, if you need prayer, we'll be available here at the front to pray with you. But I just want to close in a word of prayer. And as we close, Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for all the things that you spoke to us today and, Lord, all the things we experienced today in, in worship and in baptism, Lord, in, in this word. And I believe it's a very important word that you've been pressing upon my heart. I know many times, as myself, it, we, don't, we don't really get the picture until you get our attention through some physical thing that happens in our body where we, it's a wake-up call. And we see that accumulative effect that, not resting and being still before you, not setting aside that day has an impact on our body. And Lord, I, I, I really believe this for our church, that for, our, for health, for our body, for, for uh, relationships and for our mind and for, Lord, just uh, the attitude and for the, the resolve that we need to, to, to take on the things that you have for us in this next year, Lord God. We need to accomplish those things in six 
and rest on that seventh. Lord, as that, as that peak, that, that climax of our, of our week, as that comes to a head, Lord God, and we realize this is it, that this is the, that next day, I really need that day of rest. Lord, you'll move upon each person's heart to recognize what day that is. Maybe it is Saturday. <clears throat> That's fine. But for some, their schedule may not allow that. Whatever it is, Lord God, you would show them, Lord, it's not so much the day as it is the fact that we obey. And Lord, that we would obey and want that time with you and just wanting that day of rest and being obedient to your word and understanding the process of renewal and, and re, re-strengthening us, Father, replenishing us, Lord, in our mind, our spirit, our soul. So, Father, I, I know you'll, you'll, you'll move upon us as we leave today. We'll, we'll contemplate on it. We'll, we'll meditate on it. We'll pray about it. And, Lord, that you're going to show us and give us a lifestyle change to incorporate this into our life because we need this so much. It's important to you, and it's a part of the design of how you made us. And, Lord, there is benefit spiritually and physically. We praise you, Lord. We are so thankful, God, for all of your many blessings. We love you, and we just want to bless you. You're worthy of praise. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Have an awesome week. Again, if you need prayer, we'll be at the front. If anybody needs prayer, please come forward.